All right, so we're going to be talking about the, um, the geography of Europe. That's how we start out every unit when we're talking about um, a new region. Europe, we, it's really supposed to be broken down into a couple different parts for us, but we're going, me and Mr. C decided to do it kind of all together. Uh, it makes it a little bit easier that way, though we'll, we'll be switching back and forth on it a little bit. So Europe has a queen. Uh, David, can you hit the light? for us please so you can it's a little bit better here so uh this guy named munster uh from germany in 1588 was a cartographer and a cartographer is a map maker do we understand mm -hmm. cartography is the uh um is the study of maps uh, and making of maps so this guy said that oh look we can draw europe as a queen and as you can see, there is like a little peninsula here. Here's where England and Scotland and Ireland would be. Over here would be um, Portugal and Spain. And this is part of Africa right here. This would be Italy. But this is what they were thinking Europe would look like in, the, in 1588. This is a, almost 100 years after uh, Columbus sailed west. Remember, Columbus sailed in 1492, so they're still still a little bit off on a lot of, on, on some things that they were thinking about. Okay. Now we take a look at Europe from a satellite view, right? Europe is separated from Asia with the Ural Mountains. We'll talk about those mountains in a little bit. But in actuality, just because it's separated by the mountains, is it really separated by Asia? Okay, that's the big question. Then there's also these mountains down here in this region called the Caucasus Mountains. Right? But as you can see, does it look like it's separated at all? No, just a mountain range, right? So, and then it's barely separated right here and right here by some bodies of water. Okay? But this is Europe. You have all this spot here that covers Europe, right? A lot of different countries in Europe. Here's a political map. Um, Iceland, all the way down to part of Turkey. This little piece of land right here is actually Turkey. So Turkey is in two continents. It's in Asia and it's in Europe. Um, these countries right here, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia, are sometimes considered part of uh, Europe, and then at other times they're considered part of Asia, because they're kind of right on that mountain range that runs right through here. Armenians would consider themselves Europeans. Uh, Georgians definitely consider themselves Europeans. Aberjan, Aberjan Anies. Uh, I wouldn't know what you'd call those people, but they would consider themselves probably Middle Easterns. So it's kind of a catch-all place, right? Uh, Kazakhstan is considered a Central Asian nation. It's not considered part of Europe. Okay? So it's kind of hard just to distinguish, but usually... The eastern part of Russia over to P Portugal is considered Europe. Uh, down here in the south, you have Africa. Okay. So we're going to take a look. So here's... There's three different parts to Europe. And if you can really break it down into four different parts, if you wanted to, you have Europe, Western Europe, which consists of most of the countries that we call the Westernized countries. Uh, they're Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, Switzerland, uh, Italy, Spain, Portugal, France, England, Scotland. You know the great uh, the United Kingdom and Ireland. 
Iceland would be part of Northern Europe. And then we have Eastern Europe, which would be the Poland, the Czech Republic, uh, Austria, um, the Balkan states down here, Greece. All right. Those are all, this is all Eastern Europe. Some places would even separate it into Southern Europe, where it's Spain, the southern part of France, Italy, some of these right in here. But really, it's just one big Europe. All right. Now, by uh, looking at Europe and its size, so we look at continents by size. Asia is the largest at 44 million 579 thousand square kilometers. How many miles is that? How many miles is that? Ah, you'd have to find the conversion rate, right? From kilometers to miles to, to figure that out. Europe is the second smallest continent. It's only larger than Australia and Oceania by about 2 million kilometers. So it's Asia, Africa, North America, then South America, then Antarctica, Europe, and Oceania. Well, it's really Australia, including Oceania. Oceania. That's how I would say it. Topography. What? Topography. Is Europe a peninsula of peninsulas, or is Europe a peninsula of Asia? That's a question that we should be asking ourselves. We look here. Does Europe look like it's separate from Asia? No. And if you really want to get down to nitty gritty, it's not really separate. This big landmass right here is not really separated from Africa either because they attach by the Suez land, uh, by the Suez Peninsula in between here. The only thing that really kind of separates them is a man made canal. So. Sometimes you'll hear this area referred to as Eurasia. Eurasia. Sometimes you can, uh, some people call it the Afro-Eurasia continent, which would include all three of the continents. Afro-Eurasia continent. Uh, for our purposes, though, we're going to break it down into Europe, Asia, and Africa. Okay. But I want you to keep that in mind. Is it an Asian peninsula as we go through the geography? Hello. So here we go with some of the northern peninsula with some of the peninsulas. We're going to look at the peninsulas first. So in the north part, we have this little peninsula here. This is the country of Denmark and a little bit of uh, Germany right in here. And they call it the Jutland Peninsula. We have the huge Scandinavian peninsula up here at the top. And it's connected by these land bridges right here. In the south, though, we have the Iberian peninsula. And what two countries have we talked about that's on the Iberian peninsula? Spain. And another one starts with a P. What? Portugal. Portugal. Spain and Portugal are on the Iberian Peninsula. The Italian Peninsula looks like a boot. You have the hill here, you have where the toes go here, and then the boot goes up the leg. But kind of. The Balkan Peninsula is a little bit harder to distinguish. The Balkan Peninsula is a peninsula because you think it may connect here, but it does not connect here. You think it may connect here, and it does not connect here. They're very close land masses that are to together, and these are called straits, where very narrow waterways pass through. So that makes this little part, this whole little part, part of a peninsula. The Anatolian Peninsula, which is really not in Europe, it's in Asia. But they went ahead and put it on this slideshow. Um, but it is very important to some of the history of Asia. 
Go right ahead, ask a question. Yeah, it's about the black smoke. Yes. It's like, has anything happened there or is important happened there? Because I think it would get the name black smoke. Or is it the sea's black? The not black. It's actually very dark blue. But yes, some the name of the black sea refers to how yeah. there have been a lot of sh problems with sailing in the black sea. Okay. Yes. Um, the Crimean Peninsula is another, talking about things that are happening, bad things happening right now. This is a very touchy subject uh, today because two countries are fighting over this area. One is Russia and the other one's the Ukraine. Russia is supporting the people that live here because the people that live here mostly relate to Russia. They don't really consider themselves Ukrainians, so they asked Russia to step in. So there's like a little boundary right now that Russia is saying that this is ours and uh, Ukraine saying no, the Crimean Peninsula, this little peninsula right here is ours. So that happened about two or three years ago, and it's been kind of a sticking point for a lot of people. So Europe is on a tipping kind of if anything would really happen here, this could set off some big problems for the world. That's not nope, it's not. So it's just looking at it in a different view. You have your Jetland, your Scandinavian. The one they're going to add here is where Greece is, the Palo. Ah. The Palopine, I can't say it. Paloponnesian Peninsula. This is where Greece is. So it's a peninsula sticking off of a peninsula. Can we understand that? It's a peninsula sticking out from another peninsula. So this is where Greece is. Okay, don't forget, this is what this is Asia. This little part right here is part of Turkey. And then this is the rest of the country Turkey. And it's not called Turkey because there are turkeys there. It's called Turkey because of the people that have invaded this area from the steeps. The, then that's some plains up in this area. Here, there, these are plateau. This is like a plateau up in here. And the people that came out of here and invaded this area were called Turks. And that's why it's called Turkey. The Ottomans came in and took over this area. So what's the answer? It's really up to you, right? What you want to think of it as. Um, there's really no right or wrong answer with it. It's all one big landmass. But for humans have this idea of c categorizing and putting things into perspective for themselves. Does that make sense? And trying to make it easier to learn. So one way they separate themselves is, well, those people are different on the other side of the mountains. They look different than us. Does that make sense? So we kind of separate it. I mean, that's how I think it happened. It could, I don't know, it's just, you know, humans are strange animals and we, and we tend to try to categorize things and make things a little bit simpler for ourselves. So bodies of water, we're gonna, the Mediterranean Sea is very important. It separates really, it lies in between. So when we talk about these bodies of water, right, what I want you to understand is, is that, uh, like the Mediterranean Sea, it's not a body of water by itself. It's actually, you see this little separation right here? It's actually an extension of the Atlantic Ocean into this part, into this region, right? And then if we get technical, the this body of water is an extension of the Mediterranean. Yes? So that water does all the water. There's no really separate, yeah. Wait, so now why they give it a different name? Because, like, we categorize things, right? What I said? Oh, we like so to put things exactly into so we can understand things see. better, right? People that lived along here may not have known, you know, the ancient peoples that named it may not have been known about the Atlantic Ocean. Do we understand? Mm -hmm. So they named it. And so it sticks with the name. Now, just because the Mediterranean Sea is right here, you think all oh, this is the Mediterranean Sea? Yeah. Guess what? This one's going to have a different name. This one's going to have a different name. Of course, we know this one has the Black Sea. 
Same over here, the Atlantic Ocean, you think, oh, this is all the Atlantic, no, this is going to have a different name, this one's going to have a different name. And then up here, it's not even the Atlantic Ocean anymore, it's the Arctic Ocean. So we, we like to confuse people. Sometimes we try to think we're making it simple, but sometimes it's not as simple as we think it is. So the North Sea. And the way we, we distinguish the North Sea is because it's above this line here. It separates from here to here and separates from here to here. And once you get out of this area, then you're back into the Atlantic right up in here. Does that make sense? So it's kind of a separate little part. The Atlantic Ocean, the Baltic Sea, even though it, oh, there's little islands in here and it kind of looks like it may be closed off, but it's really an extension of the North Sea, which is an extension of the Atlantic Ocean. The Black Sea, the Aegean Sea, and, the, and like I said before, Oops. You see how it's kind of surrounded by this landmass here? So that see these little islands? Once you get out of those little islands, you'd be in the Mediterranean Sea. You go through these little islands, and you're in the Aegean Sea. It's the same water. Once you go through these little straits, then you're in the Black Sea, but it's the same water. The Adri Adriatic Sea... The only thing, it just separates this peninsula from this peninsula. The Tiherian Sea, which is in between these three islands in Italy. Bay of Biscay. The Strait of Gibraltar, right here. And these are the Dardanelles Straits, right here. Yes. Is that up here? Yeah. yeah, it's supposed to be the show that the little triangle things are mountains. Oh. What? Oh, and then the Arctic Ocean is up in here. And what else showed up? Oh, the yeah. English Channel. Yeah. The Caspian Sea is a sea that's over here. But it's, this sea is actually not connected to any of the other seas. It's more of an inland lake. All right. And the thing that we're going to know about the Caspian Sea is that the rivers that have been flowing into the Caspian Sea have been modified by the humans with, uh, the, with the building of dams. And now the Caspian Sea is slowly going away because of the water not making it to the Caspian Sea. So the Mediterranean Sea, or uh, if you were Roman, you'd call it the Mar Nostrum. Um, it's 2,400 miles long and 1,000 miles wide at its widest point. So you go from way over here to the Straits of Gibraltar, they're also known as the Pillars of Hercules, right here, to right over here, the Israeli coast, 2,400 miles long. Rivers, many important rivers in Europe, and we need to know why are these rivers important. So the first one, Danube. River. The Danube River starts way over here and it travels all the way to the Black Sea. Why would you think that's an important river in Europe? It's the longest. Oh, it's not the longest. It's 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 How many countries do you see it crossing? It crossed um, like five, six. I can't really tell. So, the, so do you think that's important? Why is a river important in the first place? The water source, what else? You can fish, what else? So what does that mean if it feeds into the Black Sea? What's important about that?
Think about it. What can you do in a river besides swim, recreation? What else? Then you die. <laughs> You're missing one important feature of a river. You what? Sebastian? What about the flow of the river? So we have it flowing, it's going into the Black Sea. What can help you? What does it help humans do? Travel. Travel, goods, people, ideas, right? The, trend, the movement, remember that's part of our five themes, right? Movement. Ideas move up and down the river. Before they had automobiles, planes, and trains, there's only as few ways you could do it. Either walk, ride a horse, or the horse pulls a wagon, or you boat. There's a lot of slides. So does that make sense? So does that so do you understand why that's important? Why rivers are important? Why do you think cities would want to be near the rivers? So they can travel easier. Travel, water source, food source, all of the above, right? And fun. And enter yeah, and entertainment. So the Danube. The Rhine River starts up in the mountains of the Alps and flows out towards <laughs> Yes, yes, pass, right? You'll hear a lot, uh, usually when we talk about the Rhine River, there's a lot of, uh, in, especially in this part, right through here, there's a lot of vineyards for Germany where they grow grapes for wine. Um, it's also um, a leisure river for Europe. So the Rhine River is very important for Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium. Okay. The Seine River is very important because Paris, the capital of France, sits right on the Seine. So if you go visit Paris, you'll see the Seine River. The Loire River, right in the middle of France. Which one? Oh, the Po River, northern Italy. The Tiber River, which would help the Romans, because it Rome sets right on the Tiber. The Tagus River goes through Spain and Portugal. Thames River is very important for England. This is where London is located, the capital of England. The elbow, or elbow, not the elbow, yeah, elbow, Elbe, I'm sorry, the Elbe River flows through parts of uh, the Czech Republic and Germany, the Oder River in Poland, this Bula River in uh, Poland as well, the, the Dnieper River over in the Ukraine, parts of Russia, uh, I think this is Latvia. The longest river in Europe, the Volga, is all in Russia. And it will flow into the Caspian Sea. Then you have the Don River in Russia. Where was that? Where's the next river that just popped up? The Don River, Naples. River. So the Danube, you see where it starts right here? It is very long, but it's very important. Seven, 1,770 miles. This is what it looks like when you see the river. It flows through 12 countries. Do we see that? These are pictures. Now, this is where Buddha and Pest meet. So this would be Budapest, the capital of Hungary. You can see there is castles that were built along the river. Uh, you have biking along the river. This is another capital. I forget which one this one is. So these rivers are very important. Industrial 
uh, complexes will build up near the river. The longest river is the Volga River. It starts way, like somewhere way over here in Rhine, uh, and this is all in Russia. So the Volga, very important river to the residents because of this. What is this? It's not wax. Not worms. Those are fish eggs. Caviar. Uh, caviar is the comes from the fish, the sturgeon. Um, and there's certain certain types of sturgeon uh, caviar that really sells for a lot of money. Yeah, they eat it on crackers. Uh, but the Volga River is so polluted that they're losing a lot of their sturgeon catch. So this little caviar probably cost a lots and lots of money because yeah. what? Supply in? Demand. We don't have enough caviar, but a lot of people want it. What happens? Price, Price goes which way? Up. Way up, right? And there's too much, nobody wants it. So why are the why are most of the capitals of Europe on major rivers? What did we say is important about them? Uh, Travel, travel resource, 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 food, food water. So here are some of the capitals: London on the Thames, Big Ben, Parliament. This is where England's Parliament is located. Uh, Paris really straddles the whole Seine River now. I don't know why they say the right bank. Prague, the Czech Republic. Wait, so you didn't make this? Me? Yeah. Why would I? Why would I? I don't know. Did the teacher make it? Where should I make it? Well, he, he found it, yeah. Budapest on the Danube. Moscow on the Moscow River. Berlin on the Spree. Rome on the Tiber. And then we have, let me see, Vienna, which is Austria, on the Danube. So you pretty much told me the answer already. It's the, you know, the for transportation, for recreation, for natural resources, um, things like that. Europe's lifeline, exactly. All of that, right? We answered all those questions. Mountains, mountains that are in Europe, the Alps, the Pyrenees, the Apennines, the Dinaric the the Alps, Carpathian Mountains, the Caucasus Mountains, and the Ural Mountains. Why are the why are mountains when we why when we talk about physical geography right? Mm -hmm. What you should be thinking is how does physical geography affect human settlement? When you think as a geographer, do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Why do we even study physical geography? It gets in people's way. Oh, gets in people's way. You can't live on it in the middle of the ocean, right? Because you have to have an island or something, right? You can't live in the middle of the desert unless you can find what? Water. Water and food, right? Not a lot of things live in the desert, right? What about mountains? Can they be helpful? Can they be harmful? They could be helpful because in one sense, if you're ancient, an ancient civilization, and you live near mountains, they kind of protect you, right? From other people that's trying to invade your land but at the same time is it hard to build on a mountain yeah. yes you gotta have you gotta have resources to build on the mountain right you got to flatten out the land and do things like that so when we think about you know where am I going to put a, a settlement if I was a human being hmm well I'd like to have some water maybe some protection I need some natural resources 
So when we think about physical geography, that's the way we need to be thinking about it, right? Not just, oh, it's located here, it's located there. But what's the bigger picture of it? Yeah, it's located there. But how do the humans use that area, right? Human environment interaction, right? That's part of our, that's part of our five themes of geography. So just because you know where the mountains are doesn't really, I mean, yeah, that's nice, but how do they affect people that are living there? Could it change the culture of the people between this country and this country? Could there be different cultural traits? Yes. So that's all part of physical geography. That's why we want to look at the physical geography, right? Different values, different morals. All different stuff can happen just because of physical geography. Now, Etna, I do believe that's what that one is. Yeah, Etna is a volcano. Vesuvius, I think that is the mountain that actually buried Pompeii. Mount Olympus is important for the Greeks because this is where the mythology gods are supposed to live, the, the ancient Greeks. Oh yeah, these mountains are not that tall. They can climb them. When we look at elevation, does it go up real high? So feet, the highest point, 10,000 is on this map. So we see that 10,000 is re reached a few couple times right in here. Right? The Alps mostly. Okay. You don't really see anything really higher than the Alps and the Caucasus Mountains, even the Ural Mountains right here that separate Europe and Asia are not too high. They're around 2,000 to 5,000 feet. So here's the Alps. Here's the Carpathians. The Caucasus Mountains. The Urals. The Pyrenees. The Apennines. The Alps are the real, are the famous ones in Europe that a lot of people go and see. They cover most of Switzerland, Austrian, and parts of France and uh, Italy. This is where they do a lot of the snow uh, skiing in Europe, uh, up here in the mountains. How do they ski? They have well, this is probably not as a uh, snowed in right now. This probably was taken during the summer because I don't see a lot of snow down in here. They're also a very important water source because on top of mountains, the snow packs and it makes glaciers, right? So some of these snow packs feed uh, fresh water to the rivers that flow in Europe. What would happen if all this snow pack or glacier melt would stop? So the rivers could dry up. The highest mountain is Mount Blanc in the Alps. It's at 15,771 feet. Um, the most famous mountain in the Alps is probably the Matterhorn. And I think that's on the border of Switzerland and Germany or Switzerland and Italy, somewhere around in there. And it's shaped like the, uh, uh, the instrument from Germany known as the Matterhorn. That's probably one of the most famous mountains in the world, the Matterhorn. Uh, what's important about the Caucasus Mountains? The origin of the word Caucasian. It is believed that from this area, as humans would migrate out of Africa through this area, that instead, I, that the ancient, one of the ancient tribes that lived here actually spread this way into Europe and eventually that's where they got the name as Caucasian or white people. But I kind of argue, well, they could have came this way too, so I don't know, understand why Caucasian stuck. I have to go back and research that a little bit to find out about human migration out of Africa. But that would be millions and millions of, a few mil about a couple million years ago. One of the most famous places that we all know about is Transylvania. It is in the Carpathian Mountains. It is a true area of Romania. And it was home to this guy right here, Vlad 
and I think his last name is Tepez. That is the guy known as Count Dracula. He was a real man. Uh, there are the myths of Count Dracula, right? So Transylvania look, would look like this. And I guess this is his redone castle. The Why he got such a horrible... He was not a very good prince or duke or whatever he was, count. Um, one way he protected the area that he lived was he would kill people, he would kill the invading armies and then put their heads on what they call pikes and then have their heads stuck up so when people try to invade, they would see that and uh, they would get scared away. So that's a little bit of tidbit of information. This is what separates Asia from Europe, the Great Divide. So from here on out, this is what you're going to be doing. You're going to go back over these slides again and help fill out that worksheet that is attached to your um, assignment today. Uh, the class here is going to be prepared to leave. And um, yes? We will we will talk about that in the history part. Okay? It's like so close Yes. Uh, in fact Spain was invaded by people known as the Moors. They were a group of Muslims that invaded Spain in the years around the year seven hundred, seven fifty. And they stayed in Spain until 1492, right before Columbus uh, sailed. That's one of the things that kind of helped Columbus get his approval because the king and queen of Spain finally kicked the Moors out of Spain, back into Africa. And they reclaimed it for the Christ Christian church. They're there for a while. So that's why some, some of the language in Spanish will have Arabic language also in it. So, but yeah, very good question. Everybody have a good day. Turn on the lights, David. Yes, ma'am. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna look at it next period and see what I can do to fix it. Oh, they are.